the world is yours, the garden given to you by God to master and rule with him today. As you imagine how vast your smallest plantings can grow tomorrow, I bless you, image bearer of God, to produce lasting fruit that multiplies for generations, filling the earth with the spiritual riches of your legacy. Very special word of welcome to all of our campuses. Uh, blessings, bless new year to uh, everyone in Kernersville and Clemens and King and to everybody joining us online. Are you ready for some good news? There are God-given virtues and gifts, resources, beautiful things in your life that God loves so much that he would love to fill the earth with that good thing. We're talking about increase and we're made for increase and we're in a new series uh, and we have just come from a New Year's blessing in which we saw Genesis 1.28 and how that blessing of being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth and subduing it and having dominion is lived out in our lives in generational patterns of blessing. And so I want to flesh all of that out uh, today. Uh, have you ever noticed that uh, adults tire after a bit of time, even with really exciting things, but children, little kids, aren't like that at all. In fact, if a little toddler find something that delights her, she can be delighted over and over and over again, and it never stops. I was reminded of this a month or so ago when uh, grandbaby Mia was at the dinner table, and I don't know why, but for some reason, there was a, somebody had a belt that had been sitting out somewhere and I had grabbed it and I was just sort of fiddling with it, and she was just interested in the belt. And so then I began to uh, do a little, uh, little game where I would conceal the belt behind my hand and then I'd just let it unfurl. And it was just so amazing to her. She would cackle, she would be delighted with it. She didn't know yet how to say the word more, but she knows the sign for more. The sign for more is just fingers pinched and hands the other like this, and so she'd give me a more sign. And so uh, being the dutiful grandfather that I am, I'd ball it back up, I might hide it a little second like that, and then maybe a little higher this time, but then I'd let it unfurl, ta-da, huzzah. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, how long would you like to watch a belt being rolled up, hidden for a second, and then, ha, huzzah, unfurl. <laughs> this went on for 30 minutes. She never did get tired of it. It was, it was just Daba who got tired of it. G.K. Chesterton, the former skeptic and philosopher turned Christian, said, because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. <laughs> for grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It's possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. And it wasn't just the dawn or the daisies that God wanted to see more, more, more. What he wanted to fill the earth with was what he saw in the pinnacle of his creation, Adam and Eve, and he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There was something that was so marvelous, so wonderful, so majestic, so much like God, this creature made in his image, that God wanted to fill the earth 
And it proves, does it not, that there is a way in which God is delighted in the creation of humanity. And it means that though we are in a sin-tainted world and the image of God has been distorted in humanity, that we, especially if we are in Christ, when we have been restored and reconciled unto God, there is something in your life, beloved, that is so treasured by God that he would love to fill the earth. You only want to reproduce what you really take delight in, what you love, what you want to see over and over more and more and more. Our outline today is given to us by the text, be fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue, and have dominion. Now let's talk about that. To be fruitful is unique language. It's biblical language because to be fruitful is a little different than simply accomplishment. It is it is hard work that often leads to fruitfulness, but the hard work itself is not the same thing as the fruit. God created Adam and Eve and put them in this magnificent garden. And Genesis 2.15 says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. So there was work to be done in paradise. So work is a gift from God. It existed before there was sin in the world. And work is something that is God-like. But the work had the aim of tending a garden that would bear fruit. And so our work is not to make oranges or apples or pomegranates, but to work to help the conditions wherein that fruit would grow. So work has a purpose of bearing fruit. And if you've ever done any work that had no aim and was not going to bear any fruit, you know that that's drudgery. And uh, I, I remember it came to mind this time I was in high school and I had gone to work that summer for the city of Greensboro Parks and Recreation Department to work at the tennis courts at the J. Spencer Love Tennis Center. And I think they hired too many teenagers that summer because there wasn't enough for us to do. There's only so much of the sweeping of the courts and checking in people who are coming to play tennis. And so one day we show up, this band of five of us that were, were hired for the summer, and they were getting ready to resurface these soft courts called composition courts. It involves um, a replenishment of the granular surface of these. Well, all of this green-like, sand-like, we call composition, these giant piles of it were there waiting until they had prepared the courts, which were not yet prepared. And so one day our boss comes in and says, today we're going to move this big pile of composition from here over to there. And we're like, why? And there was no good answer. It just was mumbled something about we're getting ready to resurface the courts. And we're like, yeah, but it's going to have to be moved from there to the courts. But all day long in the hot summer sun, shovel it into the wheelbarrow, carry it over, dump it out to another place. No fruit. And you're just sitting there going, this is misery. This, that we lose all hope and all energy when we're not aiming towards fruit. So God has designed you to bear fruit. And if you could think of this as a metaphor for all of the productivity of your life, especially for the lasting spiritual fruit that comes through you in this world, just think of it this way. Fruit is that which is good to the taste and brings nourishment for life and then has more seed in it so that there can be the production of more fruit. And I like to think of spiritual fruit like that. I like to think of the fruit of our labors like that, the fruit of abiding in Christ, that there's something in you that God wants to, to produce. He, he does the production of it, but through your work, through your partnership with God, there's that which comes forth, which is good to the taste. It means it is, it, is, it is savory to 
to others. It is appetizing for the spiritual thirst of others and the needs of others. And it has nourishment in it, something in it that helps build people up. But then in it, there is seed, meaning that there's a possibility of it being duplicated. So that's really what fruit is all about. So fruit is something that comes from God. He makes oranges and apples and pomegranates. But Adam and Eve were put in the garden to tend the garden so that it would be fruitful. So all of this leads us to when Paul starts talking about what life in the spirit of Jesus is like. And he says it's like fruit. It's like, it's like Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the spirit is love and joy, peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That this is the fruit. This is what through the through the spiritual disciplines of our lives, through our connecting with Christ, this is the kind of fruit that comes about. Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. And he says later in John 15, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So God has made you to bear fruit and you are bearing uh, fruit. And what he wants is for that fruit to be fruit from the Holy Spirit and fruit that is nourishing and life-giving to others and then itself becomes multiplied. So be fruitful and multiply. The idea of this Hebrew word is increase. So God, everything we're gonna be learning in this series is built on this, God designed his world for that which is good to increase. That's what he's designed it to be, to be a great many more. It means a word here, it means uh, greatly populous. So filling up the earth by multiplication. So in, in, in the most literal sense, when he speaks to Adam and he'd be fruitful and multiply, the image of childbearing and child rearing. And you can take this metaphorically, I think, of all of the ways that the good fruit in our life is, is designed by God to multiply. But just from the example of childbearing, Adam and Eve are going to have uh, a son Cain, a son Abel, they're gonna have a son named Seth, and the text just tells us, and they had other children. And so we don't know how many, but, but they, they, don't, they don't in their own lives see lots of multiplication, and you're having your own children, you're adding maybe another and another. But when, when children marry and those children have children and their children have children, that's when it becomes multiplication. So the, the mandate to multiply, and I want to just, I'm building, I'm building all these principles that I want you to see as we are going to think so much about the power of generational legacy and blessing and a whole different way of thinking. I, I want you to have a paradigm shift in your thinking about, about how, why God's put you on this earth. But it starts with this, that multiplication means that something like a seed is, has within it the stuff of the life of the plant. And the plant itself is altogether more glorious. Like if you could envision an acorn and then a huge oak tree. Well, the oak tree, is the acorn, in a sense, multiplied, right? So like you began as a single cell, and now you're trillions of cells. But, but your, your life began with that single cell. The acorn is the life of that tree, the, the, the seed of a giant sequoia, but then it becomes this majestic, amazing tree. So this is the way God looks on things. He looks on everything from the perspective of seed time and harvest that then harvests fruit that has more seed that gets to be multiplied. Genesis 1:11, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its own kind. And God saw it was good. This is the design of God. 
And we learned in Genesis 1, 25, God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the whole principle of seed and harvest is that, that God designed the world to get filled by a process of multiplication that starts with that which is really small, but over time bears fruit that then has more seed in it, that then starting small again is able to grow, bear fruit, then has seed and it grows. And so everything starts small and grows big. That's his plan. And everything reproduces according to its own kind. And this becomes incredibly spiritually powerful for us. As followers of Christ, what happens is that when we're in Christ, right, God has done a recreative work within us. And so in a real sense, God is doing this very thing. His son, Jesus, is a gift to us. And in many ways is like a seed that's gone on the ground he has died for us and been raised for us, the Bible says, as the first fruits of many. So in that sense, we're God's fruit, the, the, the followers of Christ who have been born anew and recreated and the image of God restored in us, you see. And so God is duplicating and multiplying this, everything reproducing according to its own kind. And this applies not just to apples and oranges and pineapples and pomegranates, not only to, to dogs and cats and elephants and giraffes, but in, in the realms of the soul and, 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 and of spiritual things, this is the process by which things get multiplied according to their own kind. It's just football fans, I know, uh, are fascinated to to see Jim Harbaugh, the head coach of Michigan, win a national championship this year. Uh, they went undefeated, beat Alabama in the championship. Uh, I mean, beat uh, Washington in the championship. And they are undisputed uh, national champs. Now, the thing that is so fascinating about Jim Harbaugh is that he was previously a head coach in the NFL, but he wanted to come back to his alma mater, Michigan, and he had this aim, he wanted to win a national championship. It's taken some years to get there, and then he won the national championship. So it's just amazing, right, to think of someone who, who sets their sight on being able to come to a school, get it strong again, and, and go towards a national championship and actually do it. What's amazing is that um, he has a brother, John Harbaugh, who is also a football coach and is the head football coach for the Baltimore Ravens. Now, what's amazing even further is that those two brothers, John Harbaugh and Jim Harbaugh, after the 2012 NFL season, their two teams met one another in the Super Bowl. I mean, they're brothers. Their dad, Jack Harbaugh, was an assistant coach for most of the boys growing up at, uh, at several colleges and then became head coach at Western Kentucky. So his dad, who was obviously a good football player and a good football coach, coached at smaller assistant positions and smaller colleges. And then he has these boys and both of them go on to be assistant coaches and then head coaches, even in the NFL. And I was just trying to think like, has anybody tried to calculate what are the chances of two brothers both being NFL head coaches, not assistant coaches, head coaches, and then winding up playing against each other in the Super Bowl? And uh, one a statistician has, has put some work together on this to say, well, of the possible pool of of NFL coaches, including some of the assistants who could become head coaches and so forth. Uh, she reckoned that to be one in 11,000. But that's not the point of it. The point is that there are only 32 NFL head coaches and billions of people on the planet. 
and it's nearly impossible to ever become an NFL head football coach. And for it to happen twice in one family is mind-bending. My point of all of this is, is it not amazing sometimes what you see just in the natural in families of how a, a, a gift coaching, then gets multiplied into kids, just talking about in the natural realm. And what I think God is pointing us to is this is what can happen in the spirit. And we're not, most of us, going to be some uh, famous person or, or have a head coaching position or something, but every single one of us has spiritual fruit in our lives, virtues and gifts that God gives that he wants to see multiplied. And you might see it in, a, in, a, in, in your lifetime, and you might see it, uh, it might only be seen from later. Paul says, do not, in Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever one sows, he'll also reap. For one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life, will reap kingdom life. So clearly, sowing and reaping is not just about the natural vegetation and all. It, it's about all of life. Everything works like that. And so this is particularly helpful when you're trying to think about how to live in this world and what it is that you would like to get in your results of your life and in your relationships. And I often just like to say to people, if you're ever wondering how to act towards someone, all you have to do is imagine yourself as a farmer and your words and your actions are seeds. And so what kind of harvest do you want to see if you're going to deposit into the soil of their heart? And one thing's for sure is that you will never reap good by sowing evil. Paul said, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So you're never going to get kindness from your child by sowing unkindness into the child. You're never going to reap a harvest uh, with a friend by um, of hoping that they would be patient with you by you sowing seeds of impatience with them. So whatever it is that you want to reap, that is the thing that you sow. So God said of everything that it, it, was, it was reproducing after its own kind. But in Genesis 1, 26, of the pinnacle of his creation, of you and me, of humanity, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So now there's something that's, that's majestic and glorious and holy that has been said about human beings that's different than anything else in all of creation. Let us make this humanity in the image of the triune God. And so we are, in a real sense, like little images of God on the earth being multiplied and multiplied. It was well known in uh, Old Testament times that kings would fill their kingdom up with statues and images, these icons that they would station all over to have a picture of their authority and rule all throughout their kingdom. And so when the original readers of Genesis would come upon that, make them in our image, that was, that was what came to mind. Like we're little images of God representing him all over. So be fruitful and then multiply. This is the plan of God for the spiritual fruit of your life. And then fill the earth. Fill the earth. God creates and then he blesses. He forms and then he fills. He makes something and then he validates it and authorizes it and blesses it to multiply and multiply until there is fullness of it. God is so delighted in humanity that he wants to see increase, increase, increase. He wants to see more and more and more at the most natural level of people themselves populating the earth. But this is the principle of who God is, of all that is good in you that he wants to see multiplied. So I really want us um, in coming weeks to keep in mind, and I'll come back to several images that you can keep uh, that will dazzle us to think about what we call exponential growth. But when, when God fills something, he starts small, but he has in his mind the fruit that happens once it goes through its multiplying 
process, that exponential growth. It is uh, dazzling and amazing when you begin to think about this. One of the famous examples is that there's a legend of King Shurham of India who was so excited that one of his ministers had invented the game of chess. So he asked this mathematician minister, um, what would he like as his reward? He could have anything uh, that he would like. And the mathematician said, oh, I have no interest in material wealth. So um, how about the king just give me one grain of wheat for the first square on the chessboard, and then two grains of wheat for the second square, four grains for the third, and so on, doubling them each time until all 64 squares are accounted for. Your Majesty, I ask, in, ask nothing more than this humble request. And uh, moved by the modesty of his mathematician uh, minister and thinking uh, that, that he should have asked for more, he ordered a bag of wheat to be delivered to the minister and servants began to count it out. And so the first grain of wheat were counted onto the chessboard as requested. One small grain of wheat put on the first, uh, first row one by one and two grains and then four grains and eight and 16, 32, 64, 128 and so forth on each of these squares. And by the eighth square at the end of the first row, King Sherham's supply master had counted out a total of 255 wheat grains. And at this point, the king had no concern, thought maybe it was all sort of a joke. But a little more wheat on the chessboard than he'd estimated, but nothing out of the ordinary. So the counting had taken only about four minutes up to that point, assuming each grain took one second to count. By the time the second row was complete, the supply master had worked for about 18 hours, counting out 65,000 grains of wheat. By the end of the third of the eight rows, it took 194 days to count the 16.8 million grains of wheat for the 24th square, and there's still 40 empty squares to go. Now the king is losing his patience, and if you do the math, the final square would have received over 18 quintillion grains of wheat, whatever that number is. I don't even have a way of describing it, but someone has said this is the same as all the wheat harvested in the world for several centuries, and it would require 584 billion years to count it out. <laughs> so that, that's the picture of how something becomes full. And the, these, these sorts of exponential growth illustrations, they, they give you a picture of how something that starts so, so small can grow so big. So the, the illustration of multiplying and filling is not just for the impressive, like, wow, look how big something can get when it grows exponentially, but it is also to illustrate how in God's plan, things start small. And we tend to pay attention to the things that are growing big. But as one sociologist uh, uh, or scientist said, people tend to concentrate on the things that are big or fast growing, but the real dangers and opportunities are in the things that are exponential, which are small and slow growing. It takes careful attention and measurement to find them, to distinguish them from the things that will always be small and slow. In their exponential phase, a small action can result in a large change in the final outcome. So once things are fast growing, they tend to have too much momentum to affect much. But when things are big, they tend to be near their limit anyway. What, what this scientist this, or sociologist is saying is that if you really want to affect change, then you want to be invested in that which is small and slow initially, but has the potential to grow exponentially. That's, that's, where you, that's, where, that's where you put your labor. That's where you put your vision. That's where you put your mindset. That's where you invest your life. Yeah. That's why for a parent to invest in the child which is slow growing and may not have much fruit showing yet during those early years especially, is the best investment. It's why a spiritual mother or a spiritual father investing into someone that they are discipling is the best investment. 
if you, if you think that what you're supposed to do is spend your time and energy on that which gets a real quick result of lots of immediate fruit, then you'll miss out on that which really changes things and fills the earth. The principle of filling depends on multiplying and exponential growth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill. Subdue and have dominion. It means to subjugate, to master. These are strong Hebrew words. The idea, uh, one scholar says, is like the grapes underfoot in a wine press. It is um, something that has a natural implication. You're in charge of stewarding the earth, humanity, Adam and Eve. Care for the garden. Watch over the livestock. It is not brutality. It is stewardship. <clears throat> but you are in charge. And it's just remarkable that the creator would not only delight in what he's made so much that he says, I want to more and more and I want to fill the earth, but that also he says, I want you to partner with me. God brings the fruit, but in exercising a rightful place of authority, there is a kind of stewardship of all that is created that is given to us so much so in our New Year's lesson. We say, the world is yours, a garden given to you by God to master and rule with him today. As you imagine how vast your smallest plantings can grow tomorrow. That's, that's what we're talking about. And so there is... Um, in the world, there is a, a process, physical process, in which things tend towards disorder unless we apply energy to keep it ordered. So the garden will grow weeds, and the gardener pulls weeds, and the gardener tends to the garden. And... Uh, a teenager's room will grow, will grow messy. <laughs> An adult's room will grow messy. But there's the energy, there's work that's applied to keep it in order. And this is part of what is, is being, uh, being blessed by God to Adam and Eve, is that you are being put in a position to keep this form and keep this order and keep this beauty and help the fruit to grow. Now, you think about that, not just in the natural, but think about in your life and think about that spiritually. Because what happens when Jesus comes is that he says that if you see that I cast out demons by the finger of God, you will know that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he sent out his own disciples and gave them authority even over the evil spirits. It is the living out of the blessing that was given to Adam and Eve, that you in this world will have trouble, you will have problems, you will have challenges, and you will suffer like other people. But in the kingdom of God, in the spiritual realm, when you're in Jesus Christ, a miracle has taken place and you have been restored in relationship with God, not only forgiven, but counted righteous through the gift of Jesus Christ. This is the promise and assurance of the Christian gospel. And because of this, Paul says, it is as if you're seated with Christ and it is as if though you face many adversities, you're more than a conqueror and you now are in a spiritual place where you do not have to be a slave to sin, but you, instead of being mastered by it, you are now in a place of having dominion over evil itself. It doesn't mean that we don't sin anymore. Of course, we continue to stumble on our sin. But God wants us to recognize this place in Christ that has been fulfilled for us. So to have dominion is to... Adam and Eve, don't be ruled by the deceptions of the serpent. 
which they forfeited when they believed the deception, but instead the promise comes that you'll have your head on the serpent. All of this is symbolic language to talk about a spiritual place of authority that we're to walk in. You see how this initial blessing to Adam and Eve, when he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion in it, that this is, this is the plan of God for our lives. And here's what you can take away from this, beloved. I want, I want you to take away at least these three things. The first is, all of this means you matter more than you now can see. Never underestimate how much God can use you. See your life like a seed, like an acorn, like a, like a, like a, like a, 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 a planting that is not measured by how much fruit there is today, but how much fruit there is in generations to come. You matter so much. And we walk through our days sometimes thinking about how small it all feels, but God sees endings from beginnings. You matter so much. And it means, therefore, beloved, the greatest impact of your life is that which lives long beyond you. Therefore, never give up. Until your dying breath, even if what you have energy to do physically is to pray, there's more wrought through one prayer of a godly woman or man who has faith in Jesus Christ that's like a seed that comes to pass and can bless generation after generation. And it also means this, beloved, your garden needs you. You have a garden, you have a sphere of influence, you have, you have others that you can bless, you have a place in life where you can oversee, you have, a, you have relationships that you can invest in, your garden needs you, so, so don't let the weeds take over. Don't ever get frustrated because you hadn't seen enough fruit yet. Keep tilling the ground and keep having faith for the harvest. Because God sees that in you and he wants more and more and more. Huzzah! <laughs> Not very exciting to an adult to watch a belt unfurl. You want me to do it for another five minutes? Uh, ha! It's amazing. It's a, <laughs> what seems like to us something small in the heart of God he celebrates over and over and over again such that something as small as one gift, one thought, one word, one action in your life to him is like a seed and he can see what might come from that for generations ahead. God himself sent his only begotten son into the world that he could love this world and show us the very image of God, God himself in our midst. And he died for you and died for me so that whoever trusts in him has the very image of God restored and our, our lives still marred by sin but restored with God now in a position better than Adam and Eve ever could have been because we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit and will never, ever, Christians, ever be rejected by God. So now, let your garden grow. More, more, more. God wants to fill the earth with everything good in your life. And that's the gospel.